just to sort of lay out the, uh, the outline for my talk today, I'm going to talk first about the ecological impacts of outdoor cats, then roll on to the public health concern, uh, which is an issue that many of us might not think too much about, uh, especially those of us uh, working on birds and wildlife conservation, but they are um, those, those concerns do exist. And then lastly, I want to just touch on some of the management options or alternatives that exist regarding outdoor cats. So before I, I jump into the ecological impacts of cats, I, I first want to make sure that we are all on the same page uh, regarding you know, just terminology here. So a lot of these terms get thrown out when talking about cats, outdoor cats. Um, and I just want to make sure we all understand what exactly they mean. So if you think of it as kind of a hierarchy, um, domestic cat, although sometimes used to refer to owned, tame cats, um, actually refers to the entire species. Uh, the species Felis catus is the domestic cat. And then the, the breakdown of cats below that is based on behavior, lifestyle, and so a subset of domestic cats is free-roaming cats, the other subset being, of course, indoor-only cats. But free-roaming cats are more of our concern um, with the impact they have on wildlife. And then there's another subset of, of cats, a subset of free-roaming cats, which is the feral cat. And feral cats are uh, generally not habituated to people and spend all of their time outdoors. So let's go ahead and move on to the ecological impacts of outdoor cats. Um, I like to start by, by showing the pervasiveness of the, uh, the impacts that cats have. So this map that you see in front of you is taken from a study published in 2011 by Medina et al. And it shows that the impacts of cats spread across every corner of the globe. Uh, what Medina and all did, Medina et al. did, is evaluate species extinctions on islands, and they determined that feral cats have contributed to the extinction of 33 species of mammals, birds, and reptiles. The impacts have been reported from at least 120 different islands on at least 175 different vertebrate species. They concluded that feral cats on islands are responsible for at least 14% of global bird mammal, and reptile extinctions, and are the principal threat to almost 80% of critically endangered birds, mammals, and reptiles. And I think it's also important to keep in mind here that the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, that's the organization that gives us the red list, uh, lists cats to be among the world's top 100 worst non-native invasive species globally. So cats have these tremendous impacts on wildlife largely because they are instinctive hunters. Uh, numerous studies have shown that domestic cats will kill regardless of hunger. In fact, the instinct for hunger and hunting are actually controlled by two separate parts of the cat brain. Now this behavior should be pretty obvious to any cat owner that's ever played with a cat. In fact, the way we typically play with a cat, the way I play with my cat, is by actually triggering that predatory response with either uh, a laser pointer or a feather toy or, or even just a ball of, of string. This play behavior is, is a predatory behavior. Now inside the home, that's, that's not a problem at all. That's you know, it's fun, it's enjoyable. But outside the home, these behaviors are deadly for wildlife. Now, Hawkins et al. 2004, uh, that study compared sites in Alameda County, California, with fed feral cats and sites without feral cats. So a lot of times people will say that you know, feeding cats eliminates that instinctive behavior. So this study looked at that. And what they found was that the presence of feral cats, even though fed, had a negative impact on native California birds and rodents. And interestingly enough, they actually found there was also a positive association with non-native house mice in areas with cats. Now, a lot of times, people will concede the fact that, that cats, uh, feral cats or other outdoor cats, should not be present on islands. However, 
ecologically speaking, not all islands are surrounded by water. Uh, Crooks and Soule, which is uh, mentioned here or shown here on the slide, uh, evaluated the mesopredator release hypothesis. So that's when an apex predator is removed, uh, the pressure, the sort of top-down pressure on a mesopredator is, is eliminated, and then the mesopredator is able to expand its, uh, its role in the ecosystem. So Crooks and Soule looked at this mesopredator release hypothesis in California and found a significant negative relationship between the number of mesopredators, uh, for example, uh, feral cats, and bird species diversity. The results of fragmentation had much to do with not only the diversity of prey species, uh, but also the number of apex predators, which can offer some control of feral cat populations. Now, the degree of predation pressure was identified as a potential cause for localized extinctions, especially for scrub breeding birds. Now, I should also mention that coyotes, which are um, obviously the apex predator that was looked at in the Crips and Soule paper, are well-known cat killers. Uh, so it's not just, just good for wildlife to remain indoors um, for cats as well. Any areas where, where coyotes um, exist can, can be deadly for cats. And, and actually, there have been several studies that um, have documented the, the predation and just killing of cats uh, without even, even consuming them. But also that there seems to potentially be um, some some avoidance by cats in certain areas of coyotes, whether this be geographically, they're not going to that area, or temporally, and that cats are not sharing the same habitat at the same time as coyotes. So we've talked a little bit about the sort of worldwide, the global scale. Uh, now let's talk about how cats impact wildlife in North America. So if you would look at the, the image on the right-hand side of the screen, this is taken from the 2014 State of the Birds report. And as you can see, cats on the far left side far outpace all of the other direct forms of anthropogenic mortality to birds. Uh, you can see that this, this pattern uh, holds true both for the United States and Canada. A study published in 2013 by scientists from the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimated that every year in the United States, outdoor cats kill about 2.4 billion birds. Now, this breaks down to about 25 to 119 birds per cat per year. And with well over 100 million cats in the United States, it's really the cumulative impact of all of those non-native predators roaming in the environment that leads to such substantial numbers of bird loss. Now, in Canada, it's much the same. The, uh, a 2013 study estimated 196 million birds killed in Canada annually. Now, while that number is far lower than the estimate in the United States, it's actually pretty, pretty similar in that Canada obviously has fewer people and has a much uh, much reduced cat population as well. Now, one of the reasons that cats have such tremendous impacts is because they are subsidized by people. Unlike native wildlife that have to struggle to survive in an environment increasingly disturbed and altered by people, cats have a close affiliation with people. Cats are often cared for in some way. Uh, whether that be the provisioning of food, water, shelter, maybe veterinary care, or whatever. These cats have a distinct advantage and are then capable of having disproportionate impacts on the wildlife and ecosystems around them. Now, such subsidies, especially the concentrating of cats through food supplementation, combined with the instinctive hunting behavior of cats, can lead to a phenomenon known as hyperpredation. Uh, which leads to localized extinctions and, and has a disproportionate impact on the local environment. So which cats are responsible for this? Well, both the Loss et al. study, and I should mention that uh, that study is available as one of the handouts uh, during this presentation. It should be in the sidebar um, that everyone is seeing. But so both the Loss et al. study, which looked at the, the US um, estimates of cat-caused bird mortality, and the Canadian study 
also estimated which cats were responsible for um, this high quantity of predation that was observed. And both studies found that, by and large, it was feral cats that were responsible for the majority of this predation. Um, you can see in the graph on the left from the Canadian study that feral cats are just a little bit above pet cats. And in the US, the relationship is actually even, even greater. It's about 69% of all bird mortality was estimated to be from feral cats. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, although feral cats um, are the leading causes of bird mortality, we cannot dismiss the impacts that our pet cats have also. Um, as you can see in the Canadian graph, uh, pet cats still have a very high quantity of, of um, kills on birds. And in the US pie chart on the right, um, even though we're talking about only 31% of the total estimated mortality caused by cats, that's still an incredibly large number and still potentially higher than all other, other sources of uh, direct human-caused mortality to birds. So there was a study in, also released in 2013 that looked at the, the predation behavior of, or the predatory behavior of own cats. This was popularly called the kitty cam study, which um, you may have heard of. And so what happened was the researchers down in Georgia, they put these small cameras onto own pets that were indoor outdoor cats. These cats were, cats were taken care of, they were fed. Um, and then it monitored what their behaviors were once they were allowed outdoors. Now, not surprisingly for uh, most ecologists, the cats killed wildlife. And you can see some of the images that were retrieved from the, the kitty cams um, during that study. But what was interesting was that they observed that only about 23% of the cats killed were actually returned to the home. And that's important because Many, uh, many cat owners severely underestimate the total quantity of uh, kills that their, their cats uh, have on, on, on the wildlife around them. So not only do homeowners, however, or, or cat owners, severely underestimate this, but many of the studies that had previously looked at the, or tried to estimate the total amount of cat-caused mortality for birds or other animals, um, has likely severely underestimated that number as well. So we also need to talk about the indirect effects that cats have on, on wildlife. And in particular, one way that, that cats affect um, prey species around them are through fear. And this emerging branch of ecology is often called the ecology of fear. So there was an interesting study conducted in the UK um, that was published again in 2013, a banner year for, for uh, cat studies. These researchers used a model, a stuffed cat, essentially, to determine the impact of a cat's presence in the environment. And so they used actually three models. One was a rabbit, which is not a nest predator. One was a gray squirrel, uh, which is a, another non-native nest predator. And the domestic cat, of course, a non-native nest predator. They presented these models uh, at three nesting stages for common blackbirds from a distance of two meters and for a duration of 15 minutes before the model was then removed. The researchers then monitored the nest for the next uh, between 45 and 90 minutes to observe both parental provisioning behaviors um, and, and nest success. So that would be the amount of food provided to, uh, to the young as well as whether or not the nest survived. So when domestic cats were close to urban blackbird nests, there was a consistent and significant increase in parental alarm calling rates relative to the non-predatory rabbit control. Parental blackbirds exhibited comparable but much weaker responses to the gray squirrel model. Consequently, while both the domestic cat and gray squirrel are recognized as predators, generating the potential for sublethal effects the gray squirrel is perceived as much less of a threat than the domestic cat. This is probably partly because the cats can also predate adult birds, uh, while gray squirrels are exclusively nest predators. But the situation may also arise because gray squirrels predate nests less regularly than domestic cats. 
Now, following exposure to the domestic cat model, parental blackbirds significantly reduced provisioning rates by more than one-third. And these provisioning rates remained at this level for at least 90 minutes following removal of the cat model. So there was no compensatory increase in the amount of food delivered. Reduced food delivery, even over short time periods, can adversely influence chick condition and reproductive success. And over long time periods can promote smaller clutches. So during the incubation and chick rearing stages, the presence of the domestic cat model close to an active blackbird nest for just 15 minutes increased the probability of the nest being predated during the following 24 hours by an order of magnitude. Now the probability of nest predation during the incubation and chick rearing stages increased with the level of parental alarm calling during model exposure. Now this is to be expected. This study demonstrated that the brief presence of a domestic cat close to an urban blackbird nest significantly increases parental alarm calling rates and that these increased alarm calling rates are significantly associated with increased rates of nest predation by additional third-party predators. So the takeaway from this study is the mere presence of a cat in the environment can lead to re reduced uh, survivorship, reduced breeding success of, black, of birds, in this case blackbirds. Okay, moving on. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about the public health concerns uh, associated with outdoor cats. So this is a, a, a table that is taken from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which lists all of the zoonotic diseases and parasites that cats carry and then, of course, can be transmitted to people. I'm not going to talk about all of these. That would take forever. But I will concentrate on two of these. That is rabies and toxoplasmosis. So rabies uh, currently at this stage remains more of an eastern United States threat, uh, luckily. However, that disease is slowly moving westward. Cats are actually the number one carrier of rabies among domestic animals. Uh, and since 2000, we're two to five times more more likely to uh, have tested positive for rabies than dogs. Now, although it's absolutely true that more wildlife species test positive every year for rabies than do cats, cats are disproportionately more likely to expose people to rabies than our wildlife. And this is because when you see a raccoon walking toward you, you know, in the middle of the day, you generally don't try to bend over and pet it. But if you see a cat walking toward you, you know, you might not recognize it as a rabies threat, and you might bend down, pet it, and then become bitten or scratched accidentally. And this is a particularly strong threat for children who don't recognize that, you know, a stray animal might have some risks associated with it. Now, one of the um, reasons for the high level of um, rabies in, in cats is supplemental feeding and outdoor feeding of cats often results in interactions between cats and other rabies vector species, like raccoons, for example. Um, so outdoor feeding creates a scenario in which um, the spread of rabies becomes far more likely. And, and it's also worth mentioning that although a cat can be vaccinated for rabies, um, the initial vaccination is only good for one year. And then after that, every cat must be vaccinated either with a one-year or three-year booster to provide the, um, the, the coverage that would allow for the cat and the community to be safe. I want to mention that the Florida Department of Health uh, Rabies Prevention and Control Guideline calls outdoor cat management untenable on public health grounds due to the persistent threat posed communities from injury and disease. And it notes that children are among the highest risk for disease transmission from these cats. Uh, similarly, the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians Compendium of Animal Rabies Prevention and Control, which is endorsed by organizations such as the Animal Public Health Association, the American Veterinary Medical Association, and the National Animal Control Association, calls for all animals to be currently vaccinated and for stray cats to be removed from the community. OK, so let's move on to toxoplasmosis. I assume most people are familiar with rabies, but I doubt that everyone is quite as familiar 
with toxoplasmosis. So toxoplasmosis is a disease caused by a parasitic protozoan called Toxoplasma gondii, um, which has a very, actually I think it's a very fascinating uh, life cycle. So there's only one definitive host. The, there's only one host um, in which the parasite can sexually reproduce, and that is cats and, and other felids. So also you know, bobcat, lynx, mountain lion, et cetera. Uh, but in the United States, the, the majority of felids are domestic cats. It's the top uh, pet in the US. Now the life cycle of, of Toxo, for short, um, has evolved in such a way that it, it travels from its definitive host, the, the cat, into the environment, is then picked up by uh, ideally a small rodent, and then returns back into the cat through, through predation. So Toxo actually um, gets to the, the small rodent by um, ingestion from the environment. So a cat will excrete hundreds of millions of tiny infectious um, oocysts, so tiny eggs, into the environment. A, a small mammal will uh, pick that up in the environment as it's moving around, as it's feeding. And then once that parasite gets into that animal, into that small mammal, it suddenly alters its behavior. So this parasite actually hijacks the brain of that small mammal and increases the likelihood for predation. So in experiments with rats, for example, um, research has shown that whereas rats would normally um, be avoiding cat urine, um, when they are infected with toxo, they actually become aroused um, <laughs> by by cat urine and seek it out. And that, of course, increases the likelihood that a cat will predate that animal and then um, continue the life cycle of that parasite. It's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. But so not, not only are, are small mammals at risk, but actually all warm-blooded species um, can become infected with toxoplasmosis, so all mammals, all birds, uh, including people, of course. And one of the um, serious concerns, of course, is environmental contamination. I mentioned that oocysts are spread through cat feces into the environment. Um, and one of the other ways that we can become infected is through eating infected meat, so undercooked meat that has uh, tissue cysts in it. <clears throat> so toxoplasmosis and people. So what are the impacts in people. This, um, these images are from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They actually list toxoplasmosis as the top five neglected parasitic infections in the United States. Now, historically, only pregnant women and immune-compromised people were thought to be at risk. So if you're pregnant and you happen to um, become infected with toxoplasmosis, the results can be miscarriages or fetal abnormalities. And this is actually the reason that many doctors will tell pregnant women not to change litter boxes. If you're immune compromised, you can actually die from, uh, from this infection. However, new research is also showing that even uh, healthy, normal adults are at risk from infection uh, with toxoplasmosis. And here are some of the study headlines um, that discuss the, the impacts that toxo can have on people. So there are now, it has now been shown that toxo infection, even in, in what are otherwise normal healthy adults, uh, can result in numerous, numerous consequences like impaired memory, uh, like retinochoroditis, that's, uh, it can result in blindness, um, organ failure, and there are even links to mental disorders, such as um, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia. Although the link is not fully understood between uh, toxo infection and, and schizophrenia, for example, um, there is a considerable amount of evidence to suggest that there is some link. Um, it's just not quite clear what the mechanism of that link is yet. Now, one of the ways that toxo is spread, I mentioned, is through environmental contamination. And it, environmental contamination from these fecal oocysts, the, the um, cat defecated infectious eggs, can be a major player in the route of 
of toxo infection. And here are just a few of the studies that, that really look at um, the environmental contamination level. And what I was hoping to show here, and hopefully <laughs> that point is driven home, is that there are, if we look at wildlife species that are becoming infected with toxo and increasing there are more and more and more of these species, what really is concerning is the diversity of species and the diversity of habitats that they live in uh, that because they are infected, it suggests widespread contamination. And we were talking about marine mammals, freshwater mammals, bird, uh, terrestrial mammals. Uh, there was a study that came out just last year that looked at the presence uh, or the serial prevalence of toxo in, in deer uh, around Cleveland area. So many people will say that you'll only really be at risk um, if you eat cat poop or if you um, eat undercooked meat. Well, these studies suggest that that's not the case, that even, uh, even those that happen to be downstream or even in the environment of a cat uh, are at risk of contracting toxoplasmosis. So we're going to now move on to cat management a little bit and, and what would be appropriate cat management? What are some of the management options that are offered? Well, I want to first say that cats are an incredibly popular pet in the United States. They're actually the number one pet. Um, and the numbers are increasing. So this is taken from uh, Electric et al. 2010 and shows that the numbers of owned cats has tripled in the last 40 years. And the authors acknowledge that they expect the numbers of feral cats have followed a similar trajectory. So cat management is necessary not only because uh, you know, of the impacts that they have, but because there are so many more cats in the environment in the United States um, than there were many years ago. And one of the ways that we can manage cats is to be responsible owners, to provide for indoor cats, to keep cats indoors, and to provide for their health and welfare um, when either kept indoors exclusively or allowed outdoors either on a leash or in an enclosure. So containment is the key. Uh, so creating a, a fun, enjoyable environment for cats in the home where there is some stimulation uh, is incredibly important. And that's, that's why I've included this photo of the, the cat tree, um, creating a, a vertical structure where cats can, can play and sit, um, and as well as playing with the cat with laser toys, feather toys and such, um, is incredibly important. But if you're going to allow a cat to go outdoors, it can be done responsibly. And so that's why I've included these photos of uh, a cat on a leash. That's actually my cat <laughs> and me um, walking around outdoors on a leash. Another option is the, the containment option uh, through a catio. So that's a patio for cats, an enclosed patio. And this has become an incredibly popular option for keeping a cat uh, providing it some sort of outdoor stimulus, but doing so in a, a healthy, safe way for the cat and for the community. Another important management tool is also to promote and encourage responsible ownership. And one of the ways that we can do that is through effective policies. So I've included an example here from Aurora, Colorado. Um, they have a, a particularly good um, set of policies, regulations regarding cats. And essentially, the the key to this is treating cats just like we treat dogs. But underlying these policies are, are, are a few things. One is spay and neuter. Obviously, spaying and neutering is going to be incredibly important to affect the, uh, the total population of cats that exist. One is prohibiting the roaming at large, so keeping cats contained. It's when cats are allowed to roam on other people's properties and, and preserves just around uh, the environment in general that there become a uh, higher likelihood of, that there becomes a higher likelihood of interactions with wildlife, um, negative interactions, predation or being predated, and as well as a number of problems associated with roaming at large for the cats. I mentioned that coyotes will kill cats, but um, certainly there are other risks for cats being hit by cars, ingesting poisons. Um, and neighbors who just don't want to have cats roaming on their property, uh, having them urinate or defecate there. Permanent identification. 
Uh, now this is going to be key because any time a cat becomes stray, um, permanent identification allows for that cat to be reunited with its owner. Um, as well as if a cat becomes abandoned, to be able to cite that person, that individual that abandons that cat. Abandonment is prohibited generally everywhere in the United States. But it's a, it's a strong um, contributor to the total feral cat population. Licensing, of course licensing also, this is already done for, for dogs, we need to also do it for cats. It's another way to allow us to uh, keep track of cats as well as it's a way to add value to cats. Um, one of the things that ABC would like to do is to increase the value that, that people place on cats um, and, and raise that value to the level that, that people generally place on dogs. And to prohibit outdoor feeding. Um, hopefully I've, I've shown that outdoor feeding concentrates cats, um, brings in wildlife as well, contributes to negative interactions that will, can result in hyperpredation as well as uh, public health risks. Now one of the management strategies that um, has become popularized by certain groups here in recent years is called TNR, or stands for Trap, Neuter, Release, Trap, Neuter, Return, Trap, Neuter, Reabandon, whatever you want to call it. But the acronym cats, spaying or neutering them, and then releasing them back in the environment generally where they were found. Now, TNR obviously isn't, isn't going to solve all the problems. Although you've spayed or neutered a cat, um, which is indicated by a, a notched ear, which you can see in both of the cats on, on the left and the right, it certainly doesn't eliminate predation by cats on wildlife. And obviously, that's illustrated by the cat on the right with the bird in its mouth. There's also uh, some mis misinformation that is popularized uh, about TNR, one being this notion of the vacuum effect, that if you remove cats from the environment, um, that other cats will always come back in and you aren't able to actually reduce the population. That it's better to keep a cat, a sterilized cat, um, in, in the environment where it can maintain a territory. But this actually turns out not to be true. Um, one reason for that is that spayed or neutered cats tend to not be territorial. Um, and the other is that TNR claims to reduce populations through attrition, that is through the eventual death of its members. And that death is exactly the same thing as the removal, ecologically speaking. Um, and so any other cat that might be in the area would then just as easily move right back in. The other uh, piece of misinformation I want to cover is that shelter intake is an appropriate indicator of a reduced population of feral cats. This is not true. Actually, when you abandon a policy that, that brings cats into the shelter and maintain them outdoors, reduced shelter intake is going to be a, a natural byproduct of that strategic change and isn't necessarily indicative of an actual reduced, actually reduced uh, population of feral cats. There have been a number of studies that also look at the effectiveness of um, TNR as a population reduction strategy, uh, and overwhelmingly it indicates that TNR simply does not work to reduce um, feral cat populations. So I won't go through all of these studies. Um, you know, there, there have been a lot of them, but I guess I will highlight just a couple of them. Um, Castillo and Clark, 2003, which is on the left-hand side of the screen, those researchers uh, looked at several cat colonies in southern Florida, and what they found was that not only did the colonies not reduce in size, but actually one of the colonies increased in size. Um, this was a result of people recognizing that, that TNR was going on and viewing that that site, which is what happens is cats are, are maintained in a colony around a, a feeding site, um, that people recognize this, this TNR colony and saw it as an incredibly appropriate or, or convenient uh, place to abandon a cat. So that's, that's what happens a lot of times with TNR, that, that there's additional abandonment as a result of this uh, quote-unquote management that's going on. 
and I encourage everyone to, to look into the, the rest of these studies. Um, you know, there, there are some good ones, and they, they do overwhelmingly indicate that the TNR is actually not an effective strategy for feral cat population reduction. So what are some alternatives to TNR? Um, so the AWAKE program, which is on the right-hand side of your screen, is promoted by a group of veterinarians in Florida. Um, AWAKE, I believe it stands for Animal Welfare and Kids, I don't know, it's not really important. Their strategy is called TENVAC, or it's Trap, Evaluate, Neuter, Vaccinate, Adopt, and Contain. And these are the really important points that, that need to be a part of any management um, strategy. That adoption, obviously, is the number one choice for feral cats. And although some say it can't be done, it, that's not accurate. Um, adoption can be done with feral cats. Certainly not all feral cats are going to be quite as amenable to uh, adoption and it might require a bit of patience. But adoption can certainly occur. And containment, of course, is key because that actually restricts the cat's movement, uh, keeps it from interacting with wildlife, from creating a public health risk, um, and, and essentially is the only real um, control for uh, an effective management strategy. Uh, and then, of course, lastly, euthanasia, which has been uh, a part of animal control strategies for uh, quite a while. But in addition to the Hillsborough County um, strategy, the, there was also a feral cat task force convened in Hawaii, on the county, uh, in the county of Kauai. And what they found was, like with the TENVAC strategy, that containment was key. They actually concluded that if you want to do TNR, that's fine, but that all of the colonies need to be contained. There's also widespread support uh, among a, a variety of diverse stakeholders for effective control of feral cats. Um, American Bird Conservancy certainly works on this quite a bit, but we're not the only ones interested, and, and hopefully I can speak for, uh, for you attending the webinar as well, since you're here. Um, we're not the only ones interested in effective feral cat control. And these are a number of organizations that have uh, been outspoken on this issue and do call for effective control, that is, for containment of cats. So I'm going to just start finishing up here. What are some of the solutions um, regarding the whole cat issue? You know, what, what can I do? Um, well, I want to start by saying, please take the pledge. So American Bird Conservancy has a pledge available. Uh, the website is located just above the, the image. And it's a pledge to say that I'm going to keep my cat indoors or keep any future cat indoors. That's the key, keeping cats indoors. You can also help by spreading the word. Um, there, we have a lot of information available available on the American Bird Conservancy website, which is uh, screenshotted below on the bottom right. I would encourage everyone to look at that information to, um, to see what outreach and education tools are available on the website, and to just let other people know that you know, cats are actually a big risk in the environment for wildlife, for people. Cats themselves are at risk and then an appropriate strategy would be keeping own cats indoors and removing feral cats from the environment. Support responsible policies. There are a variety of um, policies that get promoted in cities, counties, and states across the country. And unless the elected officials can hear from um, people who are interested in, in effective cat control, or responsible policies, you know, those effective policies won't get enacted. We have to keep engaged in order to let folks know what is an appropriate policy to, to put in place. And of course, to promote the adoption of pets. Um, I would encourage everyone, if you're going to get a pet, don't get it from, you know, a pet store, certainly. Um, I would encourage everyone to adopt from a local uh, animal shelter. That's really the best way. Um, that we can ensure, you know, forever homes for these cats. And so with that, I will end here. Um, I'm going to say thank you to everyone, especially to Amanda and the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative for having me, for allowing me to talk about this important conservation issue. And if anybody has any questions, I think we have time for that. Um, 
And so with that, I'll open it back up to Amanda. Great. Thanks so much, Grant. Um, we do have uh, some time for questions. Some of you have already started submitting some questions, so thank you for that, but feel free to continue doing that as we get started. Um, so I'm just, we have a lot of questions coming in, Grant, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with some of those. Um, the first question we have is from Alex, and he's wondering, do national natural resources departments engage with hunters or hunting organizations to help reduce feral cat populations? Um, no. Alex, I don't think that um, they engage with the hunting community to, uh, I guess what it would amount to is, is field euthanize um, feral cats. Uh, certainly some natural resource agencies do have policies and position statements regarding feral cats, but as far as I know, there is no effort to, um, to engage hunters to take care of issues on their own, nor would I think that's necessarily the best way to go about this. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from Becca. This is something I've wondered as well as, as I'm sure everyone else has been seeing these products, but is there any research to support that these devices used on cats to help deter their ability to catch birds, um, the cat bib, the bells, other things that you might have seen? Is there any research showing that any of those work or any um, experiences that you've had with those? Yeah, there, there is um, a fair bit of research on some of these tools. I would say that although they can help, um, they don't eliminate the problem, absolutely. In fact, I, I've got, you know, photos. One of the photos in the presentation was of a uh, cat with a bell eating um, a bird. Yeah. I've got another great photo of a cat with a cat bib on it eating a bird um, that I didn't include. And there's also, let's see, the Birds Be Safe collar was recently introduced. Um, that, that product seems to indicate that one of the color designs can somewhat reduce the impact that cats have on birds in the daytime. However, it has no impact on on birds at night um, or on birds in the nest, and it wouldn't have any impact on, on mammal mortality either. So I would say the best thing that anyone can do to, um, to keep their cat from predating wildlife is to keep it indoors or keep it on a leash or in a catio. Um. What is the best way to address currently enacted TNR programs already underway in local cities? And this is a question I get all the time, so thank you for submitting this, Wendy. Um, yeah, thank you, Wendy. That's a, that's a very good question. So what do you do when you know the TNR practice is already going on? Well, I would encourage you to actually check out your local laws, because it might be that TNR is going on, but it's not actually sanctioned. Um, by, by local legislation. And if that's the case, TNR really amounts to abandonment. It's sanctioned abandonment um, by, by TNR practitioners. Now, once they have that feral cat in their possession, they, they become the de facto owners. And then releasing that cat um, does constitute another violation of the law, which is abandonment. I would encourage looking at those local laws and also starting to educate the, the policymakers who might have been bamboozled to, to enact um, anything, any sort of policies or allowance of that, of that uh, strategy. Uh, largely what happens is, you know, a group of individuals will come in and say, TNR is the best thing ever, everybody supports it, let's do it. And the, the policymakers who may not have a background in uh, conservation biology or even any awareness of environmental science at all, um, they just say, okay, let's do it. And they don't hear from, from the other stakeholders that might be affected. So I would encourage you to reach out to your local um, elected officials and to let them know some of the concerns that exist. And you might also consider reaching out to uh, public health officials who are largely unsupportive of trap and release because of the, the serious public health risks. Um, I have another question uh, here from Steve's also related to TNR. Um, and he says, there's a general misconception in both the TNR world and the general public. It's believed that neutering X number of cats means less cats overall, with X being any number. But we know from modeling that you must neuter more than 75% of a population each year to achieve population reduction. That means that all TNR activities are achieving nothing with regards to population reduction. 
Um, that's especially true with the feeding of all cats, neutered or not, um, which increases carrying capacity. So his question is, how can we get the generally scientifically illiterate decision makers to understand this? So sort of what you just spoke to, but how do we work with mm -hmm. policymakers um, on this issue? That's a great question and, and one that I'm still working on. Um, I will mention that, so one of the studies, I, I mean lots of the studies that I included um, but didn't go into great detail on, do sort of touch on that. That One of them was the Foley et al. 2005 study uh, in that the researchers evaluated two long-term TNR programs in California and Florida and the analyses indicated that any population level effects were minimal and that actually and, and I'm quoting it now, no plausible combination of life history variables would likely allow for TNR to succeed in reducing population size. Um, so those were some pretty big TNR efforts. Uh, and, and he's absolutely right, 75% is, is generally the, the low ball. Um, I've seen as high as 90% suggested. Hmm. Speaking with the, as Steve said, scientifically illiterate um, policymakers can be challenging I would say <laughs> it's something I'm still working on. I, right. I mean, it, or honestly, I you just have to hit them over the head with it that yes, although you might be getting five percent of the feral cat population, it doesn't have any impact, and that we really need to be thinking at a population level, not at the individual cat level. And uh, Steve had another comment here as well. Another thing we should be doing where it's legal, maybe you can talk um, about that a, a little bit, um, Grant, but where it's legal, trap and remove cats on your own property and bring them to an open admission shelter if available in your area. Is that a, a strategy that you would recommend? Um, I would say certainly if the laws allow for you to um, trap a cat on your own property that is causing a nuisance and that is something that you want to do that you would be within your rights to, to take care of. Certainly the, the private property um, considerations about feral cats, I didn't really, I sort of briefly touched on them, but I didn't really go into detail. But, you know, essentially a cat in, in many localities is considered property. And what ends up happening by allowing your cat to roam freely is no different from somebody else coming and parking their car on your driveway. You know, they, they let your cat, their cat, come onto your property, and then what, what are you allowed to do with it? So sometimes you do have the ability to actually trap that cat and to, uh, to remove it, to take it to a shelter. Uh, but other times, in, in certain localities, you actually don't have that ability. And, and that's something that I think needs to be resolved in, uh, in local regulations. Um, I have a question here about sort of how you communicate this. So what are the best talking points when working with people who love birds but also love providing their cats with um, the owner's perceived maximum freedom, um, meaning free roaming? In the conservation work that Becca does, she says, we found this topic to produce volatile responses, which is what I've found as well, even when you're sticking to the science. So what has been your most effective language um, in helping people hear this and, and what are the health points, are, are, is it the public health points that resonate most with people, you think? Yeah, I'll tell you that there's still ongoing research about what is the most effective messaging. Um, that's, that's a tough one. I would say, okay, if they're, if they're interested in birds, yes, you mentioned that you know, they're a non-native predator, that they uh, are responsible for about 2.4 billion birds dying in the contiguous United States every year. Um, but probably as a, if they have that sort of um, mentality that, that Becca alluded to, talking about it from a cat's welfare perspective mm -hmm. is really quite appropriate. I mean, almost every veterinarian will tell you Keeping a cat indoors is much better for it than allowing it to roam freely. And, and I mentioned some of the risks that are um, in the environment for cats. They can be hit by cars, they can be poisoned, they can be you know, mutilated by people who are just sick or whatever. Um, they can be eaten by coyotes, they can get rabies or you know, spread feline leukemia virus or feline immunodeficiency virus or, you know, there are a number of different um, risks associated with cats being outdoors. And, and we know that indoor cats live three to five times longer than, than cats maintained outdoors. Um, so I think approaching it from that angle um, is, is maybe one of the more persuasive 
arguments uh, that can be used. Mm -hmm. But you know, we didn't. We, as you can see from the the last slide, we talk about cats indoors and the fact that it's better for cats, better for birds, and better for people. Um, this is a question from Bethany. She says, I live in a, vi a village of 3,600 people that has an ordinance on the books prohibiting free roaming cats, but it's not enforced at all. Um, they have some strays and a few TNR colonies. She says, the police will address calls about loose dogs and nuisance dog barking, but there's nothing happening about the cat ordinance. Um, she wonders if you know of any communities where the laws are working more effectively. Um, I would say yes, certainly there are areas where the laws are working more effectively uh, than not being enforced at all. Um, that's a difficult situation to have a law on books and then to have it not be enforced. Um, maybe something that Bethany could do would be to reach out to the, the police officers or whoever might be enforcing uh, that law and to see what are the barriers to enforcement. Is it, you know, is it time? Is it money? Um, is there anything that the local legislature, whether that be city council or, or whatever, um, could do to allow for better enforcement of those laws. And uh, this will probably be our final question here as we're running out of time. It's it's um, an interesting point from uh, Jerry saying, shouldn't lawsuits be set against individuals and government agencies for problems deriving from uh, TG and other cat-borne diseases? That's an interesting uh, question, and I don't know that anyone's actually looked at a lawsuit um, regarding toxo um, and and infections from from outdoor cats. Um, I'd say, Jerry, you're welcome to look into that <laughs> um, and see if there's any precedent for that. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, before we wrap up here, I wanted to point out, uh, Grant did reference our handouts. There's a handouts tab on your panel and links to um, some interesting studies um, that Grant referenced today. And I'll also send out links, um, copies of those PDFs in a follow-up email as well. So um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much, Grant, um, for talking about this important and controversial issue. I feel um, better armed now to, to move out and talk with the public about this issue. So thank you for your presentation today. And I hope all of you will come back and join us next month for our presentation on wild turkeys. And um, keep an eye out for our follow-up email with the link to the recording of this webinar. So thanks again, Grant, and thank you all of us, uh, all of you that were able to join us.